I appreciate everybody being here today for another fun-filled day of the Monterey Magical History Tour. Uh, and of course, today's a kind of a special one because we've been all hearing about the Western Flyer returning to Monterey. In fact, I've been hearing about it for years. And I actually thought it was a myth and it was never really going to happen. Uh, but lo and behold, it's going to be here in just a couple of weeks. So we're very excited about it. I know you can't all see it, but the photograph that's behind me in the background picture I'm using is actually not the Western Flyer, but one of one of the Western Flyer's sister ships, that's the Western Explorer, it was built around the same time, built by the same people that built the Western Flyer, uh, but it was owned and captained by a Japanese fisherman named Frank Manaka. And Frank Manaka was one of my heroes of the world. I knew Frank and interviewed him a number of times, and Frank is important for a lot of reasons, not the fact that he had the Western Explorer. He actually had a couple other boats before that. But uh, Frank was the first Japanese in all of California to have one of those kind of sardine boats, what we call a purse saner. And Frank was only 18 years old when he got that first boat. It was Ohio number three. 18. I said, Frank, where'd you guys get the money? They weren't a wealthy family. He told me that uh, there was this engine company. And by the way, one of those boats, and this is in 1928, one of those boats would have cost about $30,000 in 1928 dollars. That doesn't include the net, which is another ten dollars or $15,000. So you're talking about a $45,000 investment. I mean, that is a huge amount of money. You could buy a neighborhood of homes in Monterey for that kind of money in 1928. So I said, Frank, where'd you guys get the money? He said, there was this engine company up in San Francisco called Enterprise Engine Company. I just designed this brand new kind of experimental diesel engine. Came down to Monterey. Said, Anybody willing to put our engine to your boat? We'll carry the note for you. Frank is the only guy that raised his hand. And that's how he gets his boat, the Ohio number three bill. I won't go into the whole history of how Frank gets the Western Explorer, but maybe next month we'll do a whole program about, whole program about Frank Manaka, because his story is really unique one, and really, uh, really uh, very interesting and really important to modern history. But also the story today is also very, very important to modern history for, on a lot of different levels. And so our uh, guest uh, today, uh, Sherry Flummerfell, who I actually first met when you, you were the director of the Fisheries Trust, that's right. Mm -hmm. Which I think is a wonderful organization as well. Uh, and I've taken over as exec, exec, executive director of the Western Flyer Foundation. And she's going to take this over for me and explain all the history of this whole thing. So thank you, Sherry, for being with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. And I'm very excited. What a great, what a great turnout. Um yeah, so I've I've been with the Western Flyer Foundation for about a year just over a year year and a half and it's really such an exciting project to be part of it it brings together so many different interests here in monterey obviously commercial fishing it's one of the old sardine saners but it also attracts people with an interest in history and literature john steinbeck uh, marine science all of these things that are really important to monterey i feel like the western flyer is a great symbol of so I love sharing this story. It's really, it's really fun. I'm going to take us back uh, to 1939, and then I'm going to bring us uh, up to the present, go through time, and talk a little bit about what is in store in the future for the Western Flyer. And this picture here, by the way, was taken a few days ago on the Western Flyer. That is John Gregg, our founder, along with Captain Paul Tate. So this story really begins with a friendship between two men who are no strangers in our community, uh, Nobel Prize winning author John Steinbeck and marine biologist Ed Ricketts. And of course, Steinbeck is a household name, especially here in Monterey. I mean, even growing up in Canada, where I, where I was raised, I had to read Steinbeck when I was a kid. We read Of, of Mice and Men. Um, but Ricketts is less known outside of the marine science community. Most of him know that he is a friend of Steinbeck's who inspired the character Doc in Cannery Row, but they don't realize that he was a pioneering marine ecologist um, and a marine scientist. Years before Cannery Row was even published, he published his own book, Between Pacific Tides, with Jack Calvin, 
that documented animals that live in the rocky shores and tide pools off of the Pacific coast. He looked at them in their habitats and the communities that they lived in, which was unique. And that book today is still one of the best selling books published by Stanford University Press. It's in its fifth edition. It's still a textbook taught at many universities 83 years later. So that's pretty impressive, which is why I share that with you. John Steinbeck was impressive and Ed Ricketts was impressive. And they shared this close friendship and they shared a passion for marine science. Steinbeck studied it a little bit at Hopkins. Uh, they both loved music, literature, philosophy, poetry. And they led this bohemian lifestyle here in Monterey in the 1930s. Um, Ed Ricketts, of course, this is his lab, which I'm sure many of you have been to. And he would hold these great parties there, which included artists and intellectuals, uh, some famous like author Henry Miller or mythologist Joseph Campbell. But he also included uh, the penniless, whiskered and boozy boys. Uh, everybody was welcome to a party at Ed's lab. Uh, I love the photo on the bottom. It, it just, it shows the mid party. You know, there's Ed Ricketts in the middle. I don't even think it's in the lab, but he's there. There's someone has, is playing, you know, each end there's music being played. They have drinks in their hand, the lampshades knocked off. They're having a good time. Uh, and 1939 was a really big year for both men. So Ricketts published Between Pacific Tides after years of study and a massive accumulation of data and many setbacks, including the death of his father, the burning down of the original Pacific Biological Labs, the breakdown of his marriage. And Steinbeck published The Grapes of Wrath, which of course is a best-selling book, but one that set off a firestorm of controversy for how he portrayed big farm businesses and the terrible ways that they treated migrant farmers. So John Steinbeck was considered a radical and a traitor, and his book was banned and burned in towns all across the states, even in his own hometown of Salinas. So you can imagine by 1940, these two must have been pretty tired and ready for something different. So they decided to launch a collaborative project and go on a specimen collecting expedition to the Gulf of California, otherwise known as the Sea of Cortez. And they have a little bit of difficulty finding a boat to charter, uh, but eventually Captain Tony, who's pictured here uh, with John Steinbeck, agreed to take them on his fishing boat, the Western Flyer. Uh, fishing boat is 77 feet long, 20 feet wide, and the Western Flyer was built specifically for the sardine fishery in Monterey. And I'm trying to see, because it's really small for me, but I, was it the Western Traveler that Tim was talking about? Because it might, if you can see, it, you might be able to see it there. Is it one of them? I can't tell. Anyhow, it was one of the sister ships as well, built by uh, in Tacoma by the Western Boat Building Company. So in March of 1940, they loaded up the Western Flyer with scientific collecting equipment and all the beer that they could, and they headed south uh, with uh, uh, for six weeks with a crew that consisted of, pictured here from left to right, Sparky and Nia, who was one of the crewmen, Tex Travis, the tall guy in the back, was the engineer. Rose, or Tootsie Berry, who was not on the trip, uh, but she has a fabulous name. Uh, Captain Tony Berry in the back. Carol Steinbeck, who was John's wife. She was on the trip, but she was interestingly not mentioned in the book. John Steinbeck is there in the shadows, and on the far right is a Ratsy or Tiny Coletto, who was another crewman. And the only person, of course, not pictured here is Ed Ricketts. So they traveled some 4,000 miles over six weeks. They collect, uh, went to around 25 collecting stations and they captured more than 500 species, discovering about 50 new ones, including a, a few sea anemones that were named after them, like Palithoa riquetsi and uh, Phyloba steinbecki. I might be mispronouncing pr them, but you get the idea. And as it says in the book, uh, I love these photos, by the way. There's so many fantastic photos from the trip, and, and here are some of them. Um, uh, it says in the book, we ran from collecting station to new collecting station, and when the night came and the anchor was dropped, a quiet came over the boat. And then we talked and speculated, talked and drank beer. 
That's from the Sea of Cortez. And the photo on the right there is only one of two known photos of John Steinbeck and Ed Ricketts together. So that's Steinbeck in the stripes and Ricketts with the hat beside him at the back of the boat. Maybe some of you have other photos. If you do, please share them. So they returned in April of 1940 and one year later published Sea of Cortez, a leisurely journal of travel and research. Uh, the book on the left. And this had a 304 page annotated list of specimens that they'd collected. Two days after publishing it, the bombs were dropped on Pearl Harbor. So as you can imagine, not a great time to release a book, especially one about leisure and travel. And the sales were meager and it soon went out of print. And this was, it was a terrible decade, you know, really tragic. Millions perished in the war. Uh, here in Monterey, the sardine fishery collapsed. And in 1948, Ed Ricketts uh, was killed tragically in an accident when his car was hit by the, uh, the Evening Del Monte Express on Cannery Row. So in 1951, 10 years after Sea of Cortez was published, Steinbeck republished just the narrative portion, taking out the whole annotated list of specimens, and called it The Log from the Sea of Cortez. And he added an essay in it about Ed Ricketts. And that's really when the book took off. And for those of you who've read the book, that's probably the version that you've read, the log from the Sea of Cortez. So what, what is this book about? I wish, you know, normally in presentations, I, I can't see you. I can see about two of you, but I love asking uh, how many people have read the book. But I'm going to guess this is a library audience. It's probably quite a few of you. Um, but this book is a, oh, there's one. I see one being waved. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> um, it's it's a nonfiction memoir, so they're really talking about their travel and their journey, um, but it combines marine science with philosophy and adventure and environmentalism, and it, there's a really strong focus on ecology, and it's really funny, and it's told with a really visionary perspective, even for today. According to uh, marine biologist and conservation ecologist Rick Bruska, the book forever altered the arc of environmentalism and marine biology in North America. So it's a really important book. And even Steinbeck himself would tell his wife, Elaine, that the Sea of Cortez was his favorite among all of his books. So that alone is good reason for you to go read it if you haven't yet. And the boat itself, the Western Flyer, is a really important character in the book. It's not just that they traveled on it. They talk a lot about boats and boat building. And I'm going to read you one passage. Um, you can read along. A horse, a beautiful dog, arouses sometimes a quick emotion. But of inanimate things, only a boat can do it. And a boat, above all other inanimate things, is personified in a man's mind. When we have been steering, the boat has seemed sometimes nervous and irritable, swinging off course before the correction could be made, slapping her nose into the quartering wave. After a storm, she has seemed tired and sluggish. Then, with the colored streamers set high and snapping, she is very happy, her nose held high. Some have said they have felt a boat shudder before she struck a rock, or cry when she beached and the surf poured into her. This is not mysticism but identification. Man, building this greatest and most personal of all tools, has in turn received a boat-shaped mind and the boat a man-shaped soul. Wow, that man knew how to write. <laughs> um, so interestingly, Steinbeck's trip on the Western Flyer also inspired other of his books, including Cannery Row. According to Sparky Ania. Uh, one of the crewmen, the idea for Cranary Row was hatched on the deck of the Western Flyer when they would drink beer and talk about all the characters and experiences that they had in Monterey. And The Pearl, of course, is another story that was inspired, um, or another book that was inspired during this trip, and it's actually told in the book, the story of The Pearl. So for many reasons, this book has really had a big impact, and it has inspired countless young people to study marine biology or field biology, to become conservationists or writers. And in the case of at least one person that I know, a marine geologist. So this cute little guy here is John Gregg. This is a founder of our organization back in the 1960s. And at the age of 10 years old, 
he grabbed a book from a bookmobile by mistake and was forever changed by it. You can guess what book that was. Um, back in uh, the 50s, Jacqueline Kennedy's Library Service Act would bring bookmobiles to poor rural communities such as his in Brunswick, Georgia. And when the bookmobile would arrive, as John tells it, he'd have a few minutes to hurry up, return his old titles and grab new ones. And he always glommed on to the most adventurous looking title or, or sounding title, such as Jack London's White Fang or Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And during one of those mad bookmobile scrambles, he came across a book like that probably looked like the cover there from the log from the Sea of Cortez, thought it sounded like an adventure story, which it sort of is, but not quite. But he read it and it really changed his world. He realized that if a person could head out with a bunch of friends to some remote place and do real science while having fun, then that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to be a part of it. And he ended up doing just that. Uh, he became a marine geologist. He founded a company that does environmental and geotechnical sampling on land and in the water, like earthquake studies or fault identification. And he became a very successful businessman. And the book and the Western Flyer never left his mind. And he'd always wonder, whatever happened to the Western Flyer after that big trip with Steinbeck and Ricketts? So what did happen to the Western Flyer after uh, the 1940 trip? Well, we know now that the Western Flyer worked for decades as a fishing boat. Most of this boat's life, it was a fishing boat. Uh, it was a sardine saner in Monterey all through the 40s until the fishery collapsed. Then the Western Flyer went up to the Pacific Northwest and targeted Pacific Ocean perch and ground fish. Uh, we know it was a crab boat in Alaska. And at one point it was even grounded in Alaska and was nearly lost. And it even had a stint as a research vessel in the early 1960s, surveying more than 20,000 miles along the coast of British Columbia and Alaska. The boat changed hands several times. And at one point in the 70s, one of the owners, a man named Dan Lukita, changed the name to Gemini because he had an interest in space exploration. And the Gemini finally ended up in Washington next to a casino where it sat for a long time. And I'm going to read you a quote from a book uh, by Kevin Bailey called The Western Flyer. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to read it. In January 2010, the Gemini was moored in the Swinomish Slough on a Native American reservation near Anacortes, Washington. Unbeknownst to almost everyone, the rusted and dilapidated boat was, in fact, the most famous fishing vessel, vessel ever to have sailed, the original Western Flyer. So people didn't realize that this, this sort of junky old boat was such a famous uh, and iconic boat. But in the meantime, people were searching for the boat. So you may recognize this, this man who I'm with. Uh, he's a local, lives in Salinas, Bob and Nia. And Bob is the nephew of both Captain Tony Berry and Sparky and Nia. And in the 1980s, Bob thought it would be great if we could find the Western Flyer and bring it back to Monterey. So he started searching, but it was really hard to find because of course the name had changed to the Gemini. Uh, but actually his uncle, Uncle Tony Berry suggested he look for the, uh, the official call sign for the boat, which never changes. And the call sign was WB4044. And they found it that way. And at the time it was working as a salmon tender where they'd go and get salmon from the boats and bring it back to shore. He offered to buy the boat, but the captain wasn't interested and many more years went by. And then in around 2010, the captain told Bob that he was willing to sell it for $100,000. So Bob started a nonprofit. He called it the Western Flyer Project, which is different from the Western Flyer Foundation, which is our organization. And he started fundraising to bring the boat back. Uh, he was working with Michael Hemp, who's another local you know, and they held a big fundraiser and raised about $10,000 and it made it into the local paper. And a developer in Salinas caught wind of the story and thought, that's amazing. The Western Flyer's for sale. And he swooped in and bought it. And this developer's vision was to break the boat apart and bring it back to Salinas for a restaurant. So 
of course, that was very upsetting for many people who had this vision of doing education and taking the boat out on the water again. And then unfortunately, under the new ownership, it rusted dormant in the slough with no restoration work being done. And a couple of years passed. And in 2012, a plank ruptured and the Western Flyer sank. So they managed to refloat the boat at great expense to the owner. And then in 2013, the boat sank again. And this time it sat on the bottom for nearly six months. So when the boat was refloated again, you can imagine what a mess it was. You know, the side railings had fallen off. It was crusted with mud and barnacles and seaweed and was just a complete mess. And Bob and others at this point just pretty much given up hope that this would ever be a functioning boat again. And that, of course, is when this little guy, now all grown up, John Gregg, comes back into the story. So he still couldn't get the boat out of his mind, and he started searching on his own and realized what was going on and started negotiating. And after a few years of back and, north, back and forth negotiations, he finally was able to buy it from Jerry Kehoe, the owner, for a mere $1 million. So it was very pricey, but as he says, it was a uh, worthless or but priceless and couldn't couldn't imagine that this was it this was the end of the story for this vessel so this is the boat that john imagined that he was getting this was the boat of his dreams and and this is what he got um, but he was determined and he wanted to restore the boat with a vision of putting it back into service as a platform for research and education so the restoration started in 2015. And I'll read this quote. A man builds the best of himself into a boat, builds many of the unconscious memories of his ancestors. Uh, the goals of the restoration were to duplicate the look and feel of the vessel when first launched in 1937, so to keep it looking the same, to maximize the use of wood harvested sustainably, and certified by the Forest Stewardship Council, to incorporate a hybrid electric propulsion system, which combines a fuel burning engine with an electric motor and, motor and battery, and to configure the vessel to serve as an uh, education research platform. He recruited the very talented crew of the Port Townsend Shipwrights Co-op, who are well known for their traditional woodworking skills. I strongly recommend, if you're interested in the restoration, check out our YouTube channel. There are, there are dozens of really great videos there. We've, there's hundreds of thousands of followers because it's pretty interesting to see how they went through each step along the way. And as I mentioned, the goal was always to use sustainable wood. Uh, we had to replace 90% of the hull uh, with wood. So we really had to find a lot of wood and 20%, 10 to 20% of the wheelhouse. Um, so the original boat was made from white oak, which made the ribs, and old growth Douglas fir for the planking. There are other woods used here and there, but those were the two main ones. So for the white oak, we needed to find long 16 to 18 feet sections of wood that didn't have knots so that they could be steam bent. And the only way you can get this is in a forest with other trees that are competing quickly and growing up really fast. So we went to Berea College in Kentucky, where they harvest trees to have a minimal impact on the surrounding forest. And we actually handpicked the individual tree and the wood was harvested using horses so as not to damage the roots. So that again was used for the, the frames or frame or the ribs of the boat. As for the old growth Douglas fir, for, for the really wide, strong trees that we needed for this purpose, most have been either cleared since the days the Western Flyer was built, or uh, what's remaining is now protected. So in its place, we had to secure African mahogany, uh, which is a tall, high hardwood. This African mahogany was then flown to Germany by plane to get stamped, Forest Stewardship Council certified, it was then flown to France to be milled, and then flown to Port Townsend, where it was put into the boat. So unfortunately, the carbon footprint of our sustainable wood is not so great. Uh, so we decided that for the next restoration, in around 80 years, we'll plant the trees now. 
uh, figuring that's how long it'll take to get some of the, the trees to grow to the height that we need. And we're actually working with the Native Alaskan Corporation to do just that. And John, John got this idea from Japanese temples because he'd heard that when they build a temple, they assume it will last around 300 years and that's how long it would take for the, uh, to get the wood that they need for the rebuild. So here are some examples of some uh, beautiful woodworking projects that have been made with some of the repurposed wood. So as I said, we had to get rid of a lot of the wood or replace it, but we didn't just want to throw it out. And so a lot of uh, artisans uh, took some of that wood and made some really, really cool projects with it. And here you can see just a few of them. Tables and knives and pens and instruments and amazing surfboards. Uh, here's just a couple of pictures of the restoration itself. Um, this is when we were putting the wheelhouse back on, which was a big deal because they actually had to take the whole wheelhouse off to do the, when they were doing the restoration process because we were able to save most of the wheelhouse, which is great. Here's some of the pictures from the inside. That desk on the left was is it was there. It was there. You know, Steinbeck probably wrote on that desk. Um, and there's some of the berths, some of the beds that we talked about. Here's a, a really good before and after photo that shows you um, what an incredible job they did. And if you if you get a chance to talk to any of the shipwrights, uh, there'll be a couple at the event. Um, that was apparently very, very, very stinky <laughs> in the boat and just a complete mess to work in. So what a gorgeous job. Here's another one. This is hot off the press. I, for the first time today, saw this picture in the galley. The, the, I, I came across an album of old photos. And again, it really shows you um, the, the great craftsmanship that have gone into this. So on, sorry, I can't see my screen now. Uh, on June 29th, 2022, the vessel left Port Townsend after many years and a whole lot of love from people there. Um, and it was lowered into the water with a big ceremony. The people that you see there um, on the top left, that's the Petrich family. They're the descendants of the original boat builders. And they came down and helped with the ceremony because we had to rename the vessel to the Western Flyer uh, from, from the Gemini. Many people think that uh, the Western Flyer didn't like being named the Gemini. It sank two and a half times under that name. And this is another great before and after shot from that day that again shows you the fantastic work that they did. And as a result of, of their great work in uh, April, last April, we won the prestigious Classic Boat Award from Classic Boat Magazine in the United Kingdom. And this here is Jeff Gailey and Tim Lee of the Port Townsend Shipwrights Co-op. They flew out to the United Kingdom to receive the award, which was part of the restored powered vessel category. So the boat was then towed up to Seattle to uh, Snow and Company, a company up in Seattle, to have a hybrid diesel elect, uh, engine installed, along with some of the steering and some of the internal systems, plumbing and electrical. Um, let's talk about the engine for just a moment. So the original Western Flyer had an Atlas Imperial diesel, which was very reliable and popular in its time. And it was manufactured just over in Oakland and exported all over the world and apparently there are many still in service today. The Atlas Imperial weighed over 20,000 pounds, was the size of a VW van, and produced 160 horsepower. The new motor is the size of a dishwasher and provides 425 horsepower. It's also a diesel or a hybrid engine that can run off of diesel or electricity. So we can actually travel for up to eight hours on pure electrical power which is great because obviously for environmental reasons, this is a good thing, but it also allows the flyer to glide, glide quietly across the water, which is important for research since we can conduct research um, by approaching wildlife with minimal disturbance. So this here, let's see if this works. Can I make this work? There we go. This was October 7th. Uh, the Western flyer traveled down the coast for the first time from Seattle and arrived in Moss Landing on October 7th. And we were initially trying to keep it a little under cover, but that didn't last so long. Um, but 
yeah, you can see it made it through some pretty rocky, rocky weather, apparently. And it's been in Moss Landing ever since where we're getting it ready for a big party on November 4th, which I'll talk about in just a few moments. Um, oops, move to the next slide. And this is just another great before and after. That was the flyer coming into Moss Landing. And that's the flyer uh, during its 1937 sea trials. So in the book, Steinbeck and Ricketts talk about how if they'd only had a couple of months and a little bit of money, they could have built an onboard laboratory in the fish hold. So fortunately, we've had have some time ahead of us. And thanks to the Coastal Conservancy, we have some funding. And so in the coming months, we're actually going to be doing one final thing on the boat, which is building out a classroom and laboratory in the fish hold um, below deck. So that's the one thing that we're still working on, and it will should be done in about six months time. And it will include a work table in the middle, and it will also be equipped with scientific equipment like ROVs and, and HD monitors that will allow for real-time viewing of the data. And this lab is being dedicated to Chuck Baxter, who is a, a Hopkins Marine Station a marine biologist who passed away last year. He's much loved. He also helped start the Monterey Bay Aquarium and it's going to be called the Chuck Baxter Lab. And this, you might be wondering, why am I showing you a bus when we're talking about an old boat? Well, this is a 28 passenger, 1947 vintage bus, which uh, we figure if kids or students are gonna be traveling around in a, in a 1937 boat, why not travel in style in a 1947 bus? So um, this was purchased from Warner Brothers Studio uh, in a, it was a discarded movie prop. And apparently it's made hundreds of cameo appearances, including uh, in Judy Garland's A Star is Born from 1954, and some of the Rocky movies, the Columbo TV series, and even some, they think it might be in Alfred Hitchcock's 1959 North by Northwest. So it's in Salinas right now at Gravel Manufacturing being restored. Uh, so the Western Flyer was on her last legs, had sunk, was in complete disrepair, and was almost taken apart to decorate a restaurant. And now this, this amazing and legendary old boat is restored and has a second life and is back in Monterey Bay and almost back in Monterey. And all the time and resources that have gone into restoring the Western Flyer are not so that it would be a museum that people would just look it was so that the Western Flyer could be put back to work as an active working boat, taking out scientists and students on the water to observe and learn and reflect and create and have fun in the spirit of Steinbeck and Ricketts, um, because we think that they would have been pretty happy with this outcome. So the Western Flyer Foundation was formed in 2016, and our mission is to stir curiosity by connecting art and science in the spirit of John Steinbeck, Ed Ricketts, and their journey on the Western Flyer. And when we talk about art, we're really talking about humanities, you know, art, literature, religious studies, history, philosophy, uh, because that's really where the magic happened on this trip to the Sea of Cortez. Anyone can go on a scientific expedition, but on, on this trip, we had a writer who loved science, and we had a scientist who loved writing and mythology and philosophy, and the two of them would just explore these ideas and, and their implications and see where it would take them. And we want to repeat that. We want to get students and people excited about, cur and about science um, and curious in a way that is holistic. So our focus is on stewardship of the vessel itself, research, education, and community outreach. So, of course, we are stewards of the Western Flyer, which is a big project in and of itself. Uh, we've been focused much on the restoration to date, and moving forward, it will really be on protecting and maintaining this boat to protect its historical integrity, while also making sure that it's a, a, a functioning and safe research vessel. Uh, we are going to be doing a lot of research. We have outfitted the vessel as a state-of-the-art marine research vessel. We were able to secure a lot of uh, marine science equipment through funding from the Office of Naval Research. And we're going to use the vessel to conduct research both as part of our education program and in addition to it. 
So I'm very excited that we've hired a new science manager, Dr. Katie Thomas, who started just a couple of months ago, and she will oversee our research program, which we're, the boats just returned. So we're, we're launching it and developing it now, but ultimately we'll be carrying out long-term environmental monitoring and exploring diverse habitats and fauna in Monterey Bay and back down in the Gulf of California. Uh, we're building a lot of partnerships with local universities and government agencies um, and NGOs whose staff research scientists can then use the Western Flyer as well to conduct their own research. So chartering the vessel for research will be part of our revenue strategy. Education is a really big part of our programs, and we work with students and teachers ranging from middle school to college to offer programs both on and off the boat that integrate marine science with literature and other arts. We welcome everybody in our community who's interested in working with us, but it is really important to us that we reach young people that don't traditionally have access to these types of rich, hands-on, experiential programs. And all of our programs are free. That's important to us. So, uh, education on the Western Flyer itself, of course, is a very big, big part of this. And we'll work a lot with uh, primarily with post-secondary students, so community college students and college students. Um, one of our biggest programs is a partnership with Stanford and the Naval Postgraduate School called Seacoast, where we're developing this oceanography program to get students out on the boat doing real science at sea. We're also exploring partnerships with MPC, Cabrillo College, and more. And science is always a critical part of everything we do, but in a holistic way. So always getting kids or students to think creatively. We also have a really big part of our programming on land. And we've been actually doing this for the last few years. Uh, the boat's not always going to be available. Uh, some students are, can't access the boat or can't get on the boat or they're too young. Um, and the boat's gonna be traveling a few months a year. And so we bring our lessons to the students or we bring them out to the beach and the tide pools to get kids curious, get them thinking about the natural world, um, always sharing lessons of Steinbeck and Ricketts. But our biggest project is the Community Journal Project in which we work with CSUMB Science Illustration Program. We use some of their science illustrators and we get, again, get students doing science illustration and observing their natural environment. It's been a really big success. We've already you know, this, these numbers I have here are, have increased since this, this slide. We're, we, we're doing it in real time, um, constantly out there working with different partners and schools. This actually, here's a few of examples of some of the work. The, the two on the right were from earlier this week from uh, some fifth graders from Forest Grove. Uh, they went out just outside and did some drawing and observing and thinking about their natural world. Community outreach is a really big part of what we do too, because so many people are excited about the Western Flyer and, and we wanna make sure that we honor that and, and, and give members of our community a chance to see the vessel. We can't really take people out on boat rides, that's what everyone wants to know, but we will have tours of the vessel, including on November 4th for people who wanna, who wanna just look inside and see what we do. We also are involved with festivals, we're involved with different community events um, and that will be on, on the rise because we feel like the Western Flyer really brings together different parts of our community in, in a beautiful way. We want to be a connector. And with that, welcome home, Western Flyer. The big party is happening on November 4th um, from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. at Monterey's Old Fisherman's Wharf. The party is going to begin at 11 a.m. I encourage you to show up early because we're going to have some free giveaways uh, for the, the first comer people. Um, including we have some some the log from the Sea of Cortez copies that Penguin Books donated. We have some other fun gifts. Then at around 11.30, we expect the boat parade to start coming in a lot. I think the last I looked, there were 22 boats that had signed up to join and escort the Western Flyer with the fire boat in the lead. Then we're going to have a welcoming ceremony at 12.30 with Congressman Panetta and um, Supervisor Mary Adams and Mayor Tyler Williamson and others where we're going to talk a little bit about the, you know, this exciting journey. And, and then from 1.30 till 4, we will have free tours of the Western Flyer, of the, of the wheelhouse. We can't really bring people underneath for that tour, but um, it's really beautiful in the wheelhouse. So uh, I just wanted to mention that we got this best dress boat contest idea 
uh, from the book itself, the day before the Western Flyer took off, there was a there was a big fisherman's festival and a best dressed boat contest. And so this article, I, we actually posted it on our website, but talks about the winners. If you have a phone and you want to register, if you have a boat, you can go to that QR code and, and uh, register for the contest. And the prizes are quite amazing. They're these beautiful fossils. Uh, John Gregg is also a collector of fossils. And these are called orthocaris, if I'm saying it right, which is an ancient fossil. Um, like squid, they used to move up and down in the water column to feed. And they got longer and longer and curled. And, and um, eventually they piled up in some of the channels. And they're quite beautiful. So uh, almost done here. Just a couple more slides. Um, where will the Western Flyer be based? Everybody wants to know that. So for a little while, uh, on Monday of November 6th, the Flyer will go back to Moss Landing to finish up this final work um, with Coastal Conservancy funding in the, in the fish hold. And then our goal is to eventually have the Western Flyer based out of Monterey most of the time, probably bounce between the two, uh, Moss Landing and Monterey, uh, because Moss Landing Boat Works will We'll do some of the work on the boat, but most of the time it will be in Monterey at Old Fisher's Old Fisherman's Wharf. We're working closely with the city, which is very exciting. So how can you get involved? Well, please join us at the homecoming party on November 4th. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter for updates on our website. Please follow us on social media and share our posts. Let people know about the events coming up and, and more events down the road. Um, can volunteer. We have a list of volunteers that we're working with. And of course, you can always support our work as well. You know, it costs a lot of money to maintain a boat and we, we want to offer these programs for free. So we do, uh, we are always um, recruiting supporters of our, of our programs. And right now is a great time to give because a uh, generous donor has agreed to match 100% every donation we receive up until November 4th, up to the first now $125,000. And so we've actually raised over 100,000, which is amazing from our community. So, but we still have a little ways to go. And um, there's other ways to give there too. So I will end with um, my favorite quote and probably many of yours. Uh, it is advisable to look from the tide pools to the stars and then back to the tide pool again. Thank you very much for having me here for this presentation. <laughs>